Hi, it's me, uh, Matt Riggin, and I'm making this extremely <laughs> niche video to fulfill a specific request, but even though I know it's niche, it's quite likely that um, it will help some people. It will help everyone, but it will help some people in terms of negotiating two very specific <laughs> things, um, trombone playing and hypermobility, or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Now, what is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? Well, the joke I give people is when it's named after the two people who discovered it, you're going to have a rough time. And <laughs> with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, what it is, is your body basically doesn't make collagen very well. So in your genes, there are instructions for everything. Like This is how I build hair. This is how I build nails. This is how I build an eyeball. And there's also instructions in there for something called collagen. And what collagen is, is like the interstitial material that helps your body hold together. Your ligaments are made out of collagen. Your cartilage has it. You know, things along those lines. And for folks with EDS, the gene that is in charge of making the collagen, it has the instructions by which to make it, it's not working at 100%. It's basically like a C student. So you get these, you get this C plus gene from either your mom or your dad, or um, if you're particularly unfortunate, both. And your body, when it wants to make collagen, goes to this C student gene and gives you C student collagen. And that causes big problems throughout your entire body uh, for as long as you're alive. Now the good news is that you can be alive for a very long time and while you're alive, you can figure out solutions to work around the certain things that your genes don't do super great, right? This is a big lifestyle thing, but right now we're just going to talk about how I've modified my trombone technique to cause me as little pain and issues as possible, which I think is all that we want from trombone, right? Now the thing is, is that trombone, of course, you have this slide. The slide controls every note on the instrument, right? And the slide is controlled by your fingers, your wrist, your elbow, and your shoulder. You might notice that those are all joints. All joints that have cartilage and tendons and ligaments around them. And if you're playing trombone more conventionally with EDS, if your grip is more conventional, you may cause yourself problems because that grip was designed for a different body. Right? Makes perfect sense when you think about it like that. So there are a few things that you can do to modify your grip to make playing a little bit more painless. I would imagine that this also works for people who have undergone wrist or elbow or shoulder surgery and don't have the full range of motion anymore right because what i'm about to teach you is a way to use less motion to operate the slide than you would normally have to you know so if you happen to have golfer's elbow a certain tennis elbow golfer golfer's elbow or wrist surgery, and all of a sudden the wrist isn't moving like it should. And you're like, my goodness, how am I going to adapt myself to slide again? This is good. This is for you. You know, at any point during your life, your body can completely change up on you. It sounds really weird, but, you know, not looking when you cross the street, all of a sudden your elbow's crushed. You know, it happened Les Paul, right? So, and Les Paul had to figure out, well, he had them set the arm in a certain position, so he had less to figure out. But Les Paul had to figure out how to adapt his new and worse <laughs> body to the old things that he was accustomed to doing. This is something that can happen to you. Not the EDS part. It kind of comes with birth. But if at any point during your life you find that you need to get around... A slight arm problem that doesn't work, that doesn't work like it should anymore, then revisit the video. So, enough talking. So, slide grip is a very personal thing, obviously. Um, but a lot of players do sort of hold it like this, you know, two fingers 
and a thumb. Some people hold it one finger and a thumb if they feel like that offers some extra speed. I had a professor of mine who used to hold it with a fist until he changed it to something like this. Um, but I, you know, for this purposes, two on top, two on bottom, thumb controls. Right? Thumbs right in the middle. Uh, you might be seeing certain aspects of the technique already. So, as I'm going down, look at that. So instead of having all that motion come from my wrist, right? Look at that. On my body, all of a sudden, I'm pronating like crazy. And in a particularly fast passage or like emotive moment, I'm going to hurt myself, you know? And you're, I'm also allowed to use my elbow a lot. Look at that. 30 degrees of motion. Just in those positions. Not very good. Um, and I can feel it in my shoulder too because I'm so tense. It might be because, be because I don't use that more conventional technique very often, but could be related to some stuff I've got going on. And that means that when you're all the way down in seventh position, look at this. My shoulder is almost out of its socket. My arm is fully extended, and my wrist has changed so much over that process in both angle and uh, sort of X, Y, like roll axis. Instead of that, what I would suggest is that you incorporate your fingers into the process, right? There's no rule that says that you have to keep your fingers perfectly static all the way down the instrument. And if there is a rule, it was designed by someone who has a different body than you. So you can adapt that whenever you want, right? As long as you adapt it to a way that is healthier for you and whatever you might have going on. So if you look at this, look how much my fingers are controlling that. Really, I'm just closing and opening my hand to keep that from tensing up. Really, I'm just letting the brace bounce back and forth between my fingers. Right? And when I move down to fifth, then my hand can open up even more. Look at how much bend I keep in my elbow. Look at how my wrist really doesn't change that much. Well, from fourth to fifth, that's changing quite a bit. Or it looks like it's changing quite a bit because of the shadows, but really I'm just opening my hand up. Right? Right. Down to six. The hand is open up even more. Look at that. My thumb is almost no longer even touching the brace. Doesn't affect my speed at all, though, does it? Right. And even all the way at 7th, look at how much of a bend is still in my elbow at 7th. I'm not even close to 180 degrees. Or if I bend even further, 190. You know, and I can, that hurts a lot. <laughs> and um, it's all in my fingers. They don't hurt. You know, my wrist... You know, I can open and close my hand all day and it doesn't cause me any particular problems. This technique is therefore not adapted very well for somebody who can't do that. But there's almost certainly something you can do to learn the opposite of what I'm doing and then incorporate that. <laughs> And I got that from, I got that open hand thing from watching a friend of mine, uh, Felipe Brito, who does not have this problem, but started learning trombone when he was very young. Because when you're very young, even when you're extended all the way, you can't hit seventh. So Felipe, when he was very young, got in the habit of, I'm going to open my hand out and allow the instrument. Felipe's grip is more like this, honestly. Like Felipe's grip changes a lot as he goes down the instrument. 
you know, that's not something I'm, I want. So I just kept the idea of opening and closing the hand. Right. So what I'm about to do now is actually you're going to get to see me use it in context. Lucky you. Right now I'm busy recording a project for a friend and I'm about to track the second trombone part, which of course is going to have a lot of seventh position in it. So you'll get to see how this works in a context and it doesn't really affect the intonation too much. It doesn't really, clearly doesn't really affect the dexterity too much. It's just a better way to play trombone if you can't use your wrist, elbow, or shoulder the way the conventional technique was taught because your body happens to be different than the bodies that were the subject of the development of the technique. So let's play, let's play some of the second trombone part and I'll see you afterwards. We'll talk about it. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to clean that up before I send it in to my buddy. But, hopefully you got the overall idea of what it might be like to adapt your technique in this way to modify yourself to a body that is changing all the time. I'm not sure if I'm quoting this precisely, but there's a quote that was going around that was something to the effect of the disabled community is the largest ostracized community that anybody can enter at any time. Right? You're not looking, get by a car. Oops, something doesn't work anymore for neurological reasons. You know? So it makes sense to keep an open mind um, about what your body is telling you and to adapt your technique around it rather than to try and make something that people came up with anyway. You're a person, you can fix it too. You can change it. You know, rather than letting something like that 
serve as a dogma that then hurts your body. Good luck. You'll need it. Let me know if there's any other videos you'd like to do or like to see me do about um, aspects of my musicianship as relates to EDS or aspects of my living that relate to EDS. Trust me, this isn't the only workaround. The workarounds let me do some pretty neat stuff. All right. Take care. Talk to you soon.